In today's video, I'm going to be building myself a new home server. If you've watched my channel for quite a while, you've probably seen my previous server build, which is based around a Xeon E3 CPU, I think it's a Haspel refresh generation, 4 4 terabyte hard drives, an LSI HBA, and it runs FreeNAS. And it's been working absolutely brilliantly. However, I found that I've never really needed more storage capacity in it. It's got 8 terabytes of usable capacity, and I built it thinking I'm going to have to expand that over time, but I've never really gone above 3 terabytes if that of used space. And since all I really store is YouTube videos, which are maybe 30 to 50 gigabytes each, and I don't store my raw footage, just the finished files, given I release a video every couple of weeks, my storage isn't really going to expand that quickly, so I don't really need the capacity that, that server has. And because it's built around mechanical hard drives, there's high power consumption for spinning the drives, it's relatively loud because the drives just have motors running constantly that you can hear, and the drive's access is really noticeable. In particular because I went with high-end enterprise drives, I think they're HGST Ultrastars, they are quite loud. However, obviously time's gone on, I've realised about my storage capacity requirements not being that great, and SSDs have massively dropped in price, so with this new build, I'm going to be building a fully SSD-based server. So that should be quite a fun project. We'll talk about the software side later on, I'm doing something a bit weird and a bit custom, so we'll see. I'm not fully concrete on the software side of things yet, I'm probably going to end up building it, try it out, and then maybe come back towards the end once the machine's built and set up to talk about how I did the software side. But yeah, we're we'll building the server, setting it up, and I'll talk about how it all works. So here we have all the parts here. We can see we have the SSDs over there and all the other components, we'll take a look at those in a minute. And then we have the case, which is generally been provided by server case. Server case also provided the case used in my previous server build video. So when I was making this new build, I was researching cases for it, I came across this. So I got back in touch with them and they sent it over. So, yep, just to be fully transparent, server case did send this over free of charge, but they've not said it's told me anything to say and I'll be providing my honest feedback and honest review on this case. And this case is the Logic case SC23400-2. And it seems like a nice case. The reason I went for this is because I wanted a 2U case, my previous build was 4U which is a bit too big, so I wanted 2U. And with my rack it needs to be short depth. My rack's only about 500mm deep really for in terms of usable depth for a server, so most pre-builts, especially ones with hot swap drive bays, are just too deep for that. Which is why I have to build it myself. I've got no problem buying pre-built servers, in fact, it's often my preference to do that. However, you just can't get a server with a decent amount of hot swap drive bays that will fit into this rack without building it yourself. Whereas this case is perfectly shallow enough, so that's why we're using it. So first up, let's go in and take a look at the case in a bit more detail. Because sort of seeing how the case is laid out will kind of dictate what other parts we'll be putting in. It'll kind of explain a lot of the parts, so yeah. Let's jump in and take a look at the case. Take a look at the front of the case, you obviously got loads of ventilation and the two five and quarter inch bays there. But what sort of drew me to this case over a lot of others is the front sort of LEDs and buttons are very much designed for servers rather than traditional sort of PC cases. Because a lot of rack cases you can tell are kind of designed for just PC use. So all you've got is a power LED, a hard drive LED, a power button and a reset button. Whereas this has a lot more really to sort of design for servers. So you've also got the power, power button and reset button and hard drive LED and power LED. But you've also got three network LEDs and a fault LED. And these are only really usable with server motherboards, which is what this case is obviously designed for. It's fairly self-explanatory. The network LEDs show network activity, and the fault LED is something that lots of servers have, where if the server motherboard detects a fault, it will light that LED up. Out of the box with this motherboard, it will do it for things like fan failures. If a fan fails and the motherboard detects that, that LED will come on. So I kind of wanted that. Don't really need it, but it was nice to have. And there's also a pair of front USB 3 ports, so we'll be connecting those up as well. So that's front of the case there, and as you can see here, it has sort of standard rack mount lugs on the side, so you can just mount this with this straight into cage nuts, you don't need rails. However, they do also sell a rail kit, or a few different rail kits actually. So, they sent those over as well. So, this one, the rail kits, they have three different options for this case. Basically, the main difference is just the, just the different depth, so different rail kits can go up to different depths of rack. This is their smallest one, which I think is 350mm. So as you can see, it, does, it is obviously adjustable, but it is a tiny, tiny little short rail. And that's exactly what I needed for my rack, because it's a very short depth, short depth rack. And this is the first time I've seen a case that actually has a rail that is shallow enough to fit my rack, which is quite nice. So I can actually properly mount this on rails. Fairly standard sort of rail kit, nice ball bearings. 
that comes out there, you slide this little latch along to pull the inner rail out and you fit this onto the side of the case. So we'll do this properly later, but I'll just quickly demonstrate this because it did actually confuse me when it first arrived. I actually emailed server case and went, oh you sent me the wrong rail kit, it doesn't fit and they were like, no you, you put, you're putting it on wrong. So what you need to do to put this on is you'll see there's this little metal tab that sticks out the front of the case here. What you do is you slide one end of the rail under that tab and then you screw in to the other end of the rail here with a single screw. And that's perfectly secure, but that's what threw me initially because I'm looking at this going just that there's a bunch of screw holes in the back or holes on the back of the rail and there's holes on the side of the case and I couldn't find any combination that lined up. But I think because it's a short depth rail and a short depth case, that's how it works. But as long as you know that, that's fine. So you screw that onto the rail, onto the server there, do it on the other side and that will perfectly well slide into the rail mounted in your rack. And it's a nice rail as well. It's a sort of tight where it hooks over the square hole and this little spring loaded plastic piece clips in and then you can put a screw to the front of the case into that to secure it in place to stop it pulling out. So yeah, we'll take a look at this properly later, but it's really nice that there's a rail kit available for the server case. It doesn't come with it, but you can get it separately. It's not that expensive and being able to get a rail that is this shallow is really quite unique, so that's really good. Now as for the rest of the case, we'll take the top off first to take a look inside. There isn't any sort of toolless release on this, you just have to take the screws out, but there's, only, there's two screws on each side, so it's relatively easy to take the top off, and then we'll get inside. So with those screws removed, all we need to do is pull the top forward, and it'll come off. So, that's the top of the case off. It's pretty thick metal. If I had to criticise it a little bit, the edges are quite sharp, so you need to be a bit careful, but apart from that, that is very solid, it's very thick, which is good. Just need to watch for those sharp edges. But it definitely doesn't feel flimsy at all, which is good. So that off we now see inside the case. And as you can see, there's a lot of open space inside here. On the back, you've got the space for the ATX power supply here, and you've got a bunch of expansion slots. These are all half height expansion slots, perfectly fine for this sort of case. And it's designed for a micro ATX board. And then it's got sort of removable blanks there. It's nice to see that these blanks are actually the ones that you screw out and they're reusable. They're not those, those snap out types. You've got space for an IO shield here. And what's quite sort of nice with this, I sort of noticed, is that the expansion slots and IO shield are quite set back into the case. So even when you're looking at the depth of this case already being quite short depth, because the IO and all your ports are also recessed a bit into the case, it buys you a bit more space behind, a bit more depth, because you've not got the cables all sticking at the back of the machine, which would add to the depth, so that's quite good. Now interestingly, you've also got this additional slot here, and this is like another expansion slot for a full height card. Now this does just have a sort of snap out blank, it's not a sort of reusable one, but it's not a huge deal. But this is like a little bracket for fitting in additional full height cards. Now of course there's no way you're going to have a slot up here and you're unlikely to get a riser for your motherboard that's going to sort of fit into this. But what you could do with this is you could easily enough mount a full height expansion card in here, just have it, having it kind of hovering up here. And then just use one of those sort of PCI Express ribbon cables to come out your, out your card and down into a slot on your motherboard. You could even do it into like an M.2 slot if you wanted, if you needed an extra slot. So that's quite nice to have there. It kind of just gives you that flexibility that even though this is designed for, for low profile cards, you could fit a single high, high profile you know, full size card in there if you needed to. Potentially things like SAS expanders as well could be quite nice, you know, they don't even need to go into a slot, but they tend to mount into an expansion bay, so you could potentially hang a SAS expander up here. It's nice to have that, so sort of a little surprise getting that there. Then down the front of the case we have the drive bays. So over here you have two three and a half inch internal bays, and the way these work is there's a screw on each side, that lifts out this sort of metal tray thing, and then there's a sort of rubber dampened hole on each side and you can just screw your drive into that. So that's pretty simple. Personally, I think I might actually just take these out and leave them out, purely because if I take these out, it gives a nice sort of flat surface here to route some cables around, because obviously it's a server case, you don't really get sort of decent cable management space, and I need to obviously route those um, big ATX and EPS power connections from the power supply over here over to the motherboard here. So I might just take these out, because that then gives me a sort of nice surface I can route the cables around on and keeps them out of the way. So yeah, but you do get these if you did want to mount 3.5 inch drives. Next up here you've got the five and a quarter inch drives and you've got this weird lever here that took me a while to figure out. The way this works is it's a sort of toolless mechanism for installing them and I suppose it's because otherwise it would be quite hard to try and screw into that. So the way this works is this slides back and forward so if you push this forward that's now unlocked the five and a quarter inch drives. So you can carefully push them forward or push the, cat, push the blanks or your drives forward and remove them from the case. Now I'm being quite careful here because when I mentioned the edges are sharp that was the one time I had a bit of an incident was when I was first pushing this out, I pushed that forward 
and my thumb or my, the side of my hand caught this bit of metal here and it was quite sharp and I cut myself. So just be a bit careful there. But if you pull these out, you get these two sort of filler panels. And these are quite cool because even though they're just filler panels that I'll be taking out, they do actually have space internally to mount another three and a half inch drive. So as standard in this case, you could actually mount four three and a half inch drives just using these sort of additional trays, which is quite cool. And as I mentioned, it has a sort of toolless mechanism for mounting these, and it uses these metal plates here. You get ones on the existing sort of filler panels, and you also get a couple of spares in the back as well. And essentially what you do with this is you take it, you put it on the side of your drive so that these like little pegs go into the screw holes, and you line it up so that, I can't remember which way it goes, and um, I'll pull the other one out to take a look. Yeah, you line it up so this little springy piece is sort of sprung at the front, and the idea is that you can push it in, and then with this lever pushed in, you'll be able to pull it out again. But if you pull this lever backwards, if you were to try and pull the drive out, this little bit here catches so it won't pull out, and it seems to hold it really securely. So yeah, that's how you mount these drives. So yep, we won't be using these filler panels in this build, but we will be using these little brackets, so I'll need those. In terms of cables, you've got a couple of cables coming from the front panel. You've got a standard USB 3 header for those USB ports. Nice to see USB 3. And then you've got these headers for all the LEDs. So they're fairly standard. You've just got power, hard drive, power switch, reset switch, and then an LED for each neck and an LED for the alarm. So yeah, it's fairly standard. And then finally, you'll see you have these three fan cables and these are for the included fans. And you can see they're down there in front of the case here. There's three 50 mil sort of fans, basically. And they broke blow air into the case to cool the machine. Now it's nice to see that they are at least three pin fans, so they are speed, the speed is monitored so the motherboard can monitor them. But for this build I want to have speed controlled fans. So I'll be taking these fans out and I'll be replacing them with PWM speed controlled fans just because that's, that'll be a lot quieter. I don't really need the airflow, so being able to turn the fan speed down quite, is quite important. I did try these fans out and they're not deadly loud, but because I sit next to this machine all day, I kind of want to take these out just to make it a bit quieter, so that's fine, so go do that as well. Now the only slightly tricky thing is actually getting to these fans, it took me a little while to figure it out because obviously they're installed under there and I couldn't work out how to get these out and I'm trying to remove this whole panel here and this piece and I was taking screws everywhere and it wasn't coming out. It turns out removing this sort of piece here is possible but it's not really ideal, you don't really want to be doing it. So instead to replace these fans what you need to do is take these two screws out on either side at the lugs which then removes the little handle and removes the little piece at the back here. That sort of separates that. And then all you need to do is if you go under the case, there's three screws on this black piece here. And if you unscrew all of those, what will then happen is this black front panel will come off the case and you can then easily access the fans from the front. So a little bit fiddly, but it is possible. Okay, so after doing that, I've now removed the front panel. It's a bit fiddly, you wouldn't want to do it all that often, but it is possible. So with that now removed, we can now lift that up there, take that out, and as you can see, you can see the fans in there. So all we need to do to actually like remove these fans now, if I look down properly at it, is all we need to do is there's two screws at the top of each fan, so you need to undo those screws, take the fans out and put the new fans in. So that's perfectly fine. The only other thing of note is that this case also does include a built-in dust filter in this front panel. Take this out totally out of the way. It has this little dust filter in here. It's up to you really whether you leave this in or not. Personally, I don't really like dust filters on servers. Just because it runs 24-7, it does get dusty and then you need to take, kind of take the server down to clean it out, otherwise it's going to sort of clog up. With a server, I'd rather just let the inside get a bit dusty and then occasionally clean out the inside of the machine rather than having to try and clean dust filters which tend to clog up. So personally, I'm going to take this out, but it's up to you. At least it's nice, I suppose, you get, if you get the option because you may be building these in sort of as more of a desktop and it might be in a super dusty environment, in which case you might want to leave that in, but yeah, that can come out there. So now that we've seen the case, let's go ahead and take a look at all the other parts we'll be using for this build. Now, if you look at this, you'll notice we're missing a few quite important components. You know, there's no motherboard or RAM or processor or storage controller or anything like that. So yeah, we'll need to go and get that. Give me a sec. So we'll get those other parts in. So here we go. Uh, 
Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's another server. I'm going to need to explain this. So yeah, when I was researching this, I was looking at all different parts, and I initially went down the route of looking at Xeon E3s again, because they seem like pretty good chips. Or I think it's not E3s now, it's like Xeon E2000s, the series. The, the lower end sort of Xeons are based off of the desktop chips. So I went down that route, and they looked quite good. However, with the current chip shortage, there isn't that much stock availability of them, and they're quite expensive. So I started looking in the second-hand market for them, and then came across this build. And this server was such a good deal, I immediately jumped at it. So what we'll be doing is we'll take the server apart, we'll be taking the motherboard processor RAM out of it, and they'll be using that to do this build. And this is quite an interesting machine, it's a bit of a different platform than people have seen before. So we'll go into it and take a look at it. So yeah, let's get the table cleared out, pop the server open, and see what parts we've got. And when we look at the price I paid for this, you'll see why I jumped at this, because it was a very good deal for the hardware it contains. So here we have the server. And if you see here, you can see a brand name, and that is Datto. Now, Datto is not a company I'd really heard of before, but they seem to make sort of business continuity and backup systems. I think they do software and virtual appliances as well, but they also sell these hardware appliances. It's the sort of thing that if you're a big business that's got a lot of money, you go to them, you buy this magical box, mainly for the software that runs on it. You probably pay software licensing on top of that, I'm not sure. And this magical box does all your backups and stuff like that. But realistically, it is just an x86 server running their special software. And obviously the software has all been wiped off it since, but underneath it is just an x86 server. And the key thing with this is how cheaply I got it. So I only paid £450 for this machine. Now, that could be a great deal or that could be a rubbish deal depending on what's inside it. So when we get inside, you'll see how much hardware it actually has. And we'll work out how much this really is worth because this was a really good deal. And there's quite a lot of these on eBay at the moment. I think it's the sort of thing that's getting to the point that either it's been deprecated so their companies are getting rid of them or maybe their you know, companies are moving away from Datto or just have got to a point that they're getting past their warranty period so they're being replaced because there's quite a few of these. I've seen quite a lot of these on eBay. There's a couple of different generations. This is the newer one, but we'll talk about that when we get into the hardware. So let's pop the top off and see what I got for my £450. Because realistically, I was struggling to build anything really comparable to this for less. So... That's what we have inside. So the first thing you'll see here is the motherboard. And this is customised slightly to Datto, but there isn't really much. It is based in off-the-shelf motherboard. The model number on this board is S4P2143. And that's the sort of Datto part number for it, because this is a Cirrus 4, hence S4. However, looking on the ASRock Rack website, because it's an ASRock Rack board, it seems basically identical to the D2143D8UM. The only difference I can really see between the ASRock part and this part here is that the ASRock motherboard has a USB 2 header and a USB 3A port, whereas this has a single USB 3 header. That's the only real difference I can see. And what's quite interesting with this is this is a Xeon D based motherboard. Now, if you haven't heard of the Xeon D, it's an Intel, Intel sort of high-end system-on-chip platform for servers. You can think of it a bit like an Atom, in the sense it is a single CPU on the motherboard that handles everything and it's soldered to the motherboard. However, unlike the Atom, this is actually a really powerful chip. And in particular, this one is the second generation of Xeon D. It's Skylake-based, which sounds old, but bear in mind that Xeons tend to lag behind desktop CPUs a little bit. So this CPU only came out in like 2018 I think and then they still make it it's still a current model I think they're just about to replace it with a newer generation but it's not actually that old there's also other data appliances based around the older 1500 series Xeon D chips which should also be a perfectly viable option but I went for this because it was around about the same price and it's a fair bit newer and interestingly these Xeon D chips are actually, I would say, closer to the Xeon scalable platform high-end CPUs than they are to something like the Xeon E CPUs. And that's because this little embedded chip here has eight cores, 16 threads, it's got hyper-threading, it's a 65 watt TDP, so it's relatively power efficient, but it is still pretty powerful. And it has quad channel memory. So this has full quad channel memory support, so that's what this RAM will be running in, it's DDR4. And also, unlike the Xeon E chips, which again only support dual channel memory, this also supports registered ECC memory, 
whereas Xeon E chips only support unregistered ECC. And this is quite useful, mainly if you're buying RAM secondhand, because secondhand registered ECC memory is super cheap. And that's really for a couple of reasons. First of all, it doesn't generally work in standard desktop hardware, whereas unregistered ECC memory quite often can, so there's not really a sort of market for it secondhand. And additionally, because it's the type of RAM that comes out of servers that are disposed of en masse from big companies, there's huge amounts of this memory in the secondhand market. Now speaking of RAM, this has it has 64 gigs of RAM. It's got eight eight gigabyte sticks, and it's DDR4. However, if I want to upgrade this, looking on eBay right now, I can get 128 gigs of RAM for this machine for about 140 pounds. Registered ECC memory is super cheap. It's also nice having ECC memory for like error correcting and stuff like that, and having a nice reliable server. But the fact that these Xeon D chips support registered ECC means that secondhand memory is really cheap, and it kind of just also shows that this comes from the higher end Xeon scalable system series platform rather than coming from like the lower end Xeon E series chips. So what I'll do is I'll spin it around and get it a little bit closer and take a look at the motherboard and I'll take a look at the other hardware as well. Okay so I was rambling on a bit there but yeah we'll take a look at this hardware. So this is the machine here and as, you, as I mentioned before if we take the RAM out we'll see that each of these is an 8 gig stick of DDR4 registered memory. So that's 64 gigs which is absolutely plenty for what I'm doing here. Of course I could upgrade it but I don't really need more but that is an absolute ton of RAM for this machine. So yeah, that's the memory there. Obviously there's a lot of that, we'll take all that out in a minute. Also got this riser card we can take out here. And yeah, that is the sort of motherboard. So we'll take the riser card out just to take a look, we'll need to take the whole machine apart. And obviously the CPU's under that heatsink. We won't take that off, but interestingly actually looking at pictures, it's actually a, essentially a full-size Intel chip with integrated heat spreader. It's not like a little Atom thing at all. And there's that heatsink there. We'll need to do some interesting stuff to cool this because obviously it's currently designed for this case with these big fans blowing air directly across it. But I've got a plan for that, so we'll take a look at that later. And as I mentioned, speaking of this chip, it's a Xeon D 2143IT, which is their Skylake generation chip released in 2018. It's 8 core, 16 thread, base clock of 2.2 gigahertz, and it boosts up to 3 gigahertz. So it's actually a pretty powerful little CPU. And the interesting thing with the Xeon D is it's a system one chip. So essentially where you normally have your chipset and your CPU, with this it's all embedded into the one, one single chip. And this, this chip is extremely powerful. For example, in terms of storage, this chip has 12 SATA ports. And that means with this I don't really need to worry about a separate HBA. With a traditional server like my old one, you've maybe only got 4 SATA ports on the motherboard, it's not enough. So you then need to have to buy an HBA which is quite expensive, put that in, flash firmware on it, and then having that HBA also requires additional power consumption. Whereas these 12 SATA ports down here are connected directly into this chip, so you don't need any of that extra stuff. Now it doesn't support SAS, it's only SATA, but for the SSDs I'm using that's absolutely fine. And that'll hopefully save a fair bit of power consumption and additional cost time to get those additional parts in. So for the storage you'll see down here there's a bunch of different SATA ports. There's four SATA ports here that are just normal SATA ports, and there's these two mini SAS connectors that are again just four SATA ports on each, and I've got some breakout cables for those. So yeah, that runs off this chip. Now I mentioned that there's older generations of this machine from Datto, and they use the D1500 series Xeon Ds. They're not quite as powerful and don't quite have as many onboard SATA ports, but those boards are also worth looking at for this sort of system, because what Datto have done on those, or ASRock I think have done on those, is they've actually embedded an LSI HBA onto the motherboard, and apparently you can just flash the IT firmware onto that. So you could actually get one of those and still have, I think they do 16 ports on the motherboard. And yeah, you have one motherboard with enough SATA ports just because it's got that built in HBA, so that's another option. Now the other thing integrated into the SOC is the network interfaces. And this chip actually has up to four 10 gig network, 10 gig network interfaces built into it. And because obviously it's a high-end Intel Xeon chip, they're pretty high-end Intel NICs, so they've got all the features you need in terms of virtualization and stuff like that. It's really pretty powerful. Plus the other benefit of actually having it built into this CPU is whereas a lot of server NICs, especially 10 gig ones, require a lot of cooling because they're designed for very high airflow cases, with all that heat concentrated on this one heatsink, I only need to worry about cooling that one chip. I don't need to worry about cooling all these add-on NICs. So that's really good. Now down the back you'll see this additional board I'm taking out here, and you may think, wait, but isn't that a network card? Sort of, but not quite. The actual network controllers itself 
is inside the CPU here. And I've just dropped that screw down there. That's very inconvenient. But what it doesn't have is the Ethernet FIES built in. That's the thing that converts to the physical Ethernet interface that you're going to connect into on the back. So what this motherboard has is these cards that they call mezzanine cards. And this contains the Ethernet FIES. So the idea is that you can get different cards like this that will have different interfaces depending on what you need. So as standard, this machine has come with two 10G based T ports. So that's two 10 gigabit ports over copper. I'd have probably rather had SFP, but this will do. I mean, I'm not actually going to be using 10 gig for this anyway, at least for a while, but it's nice I've got that. Now, one thing to bear in mind, just something I sort of saw as an observation, is that apparently this doesn't support N base T, so it won't support um, 5 gig or 2.5 gig Ethernet, it only supports 1 gig or 10 gig. So that's just something to bear in mind that you couldn't just plug this into a cheap 2.5 gig switch without having a switch that also took 10 gig. So that's something to bear in mind. But yeah, that's this card here. So this isn't the network controller itself, it's just the Ethernet FIES. And while it does have a heatsink, it won't require really any active cooling, which you would require if it was actually a full-on network card. However, you'll notice there is actually quite a lot of interesting connectors here. And that's because you can actually get different riser cards for this, and some of those can be full-on network cards. So this one connects onto this interface here, and that's just for the Ethernet FIES that are connected directly onto the CPU here. However, looking at the datasheet for this board, these other two connectors have 8x PCIe lanes. So the idea is that you can actually get other mezzanine cards that actually house the network controller themselves that plug into the same space but connect over PCI Express. So it's pretty flexible. They do sell other FI cards that do integrate with the Xeon D CPU. They sell ones that either have this one here, they sell one with two SFP Plus ports, or they sell one that I think had four gigabit Ethernet NICs. So you can do that as well. Of course, this will do absolutely fine. I'll run it a gigabit for now, but I can maybe upgrade it down the line or upgrade my network down the line to use this car to its full potential. And while you can see the board there again is branded by Dasso there, as is this here, they're basically identical to the ASRock parts, apart from a couple of minor tweaks. So yeah, it's basically an ASRock board. So yeah, that's network card out. So what else do we have here? Well, next up, we've got this little SSD on the motherboard. And this is a little Intel Optane drive. And I think it's 58 gig. Now, again, I'm not going to be using this but it's nice that it came with it. I suppose I'll keep it around as a spare. But this is obviously what the machine would have originally booted from. So yeah, what we now need to do is obviously disconnect the rest of this, get the RAM out and get the whole motherboard out of the case, and then we can start building a new build. But before we do that, we'll take a look at all the other hardware that's in here as well, because even though all I actually really bought this for is a motherboard, processor and RAM, there's a lot of other additional hardware in here that I could either sell on or use. Okay, so I've pulled all the RAM out, starting to disassemble this, but there's a few other parts in this we'll take a look at. So first of all, if you look in the front, there's a couple of hard drives. So we'll pull these out, and you'll see that we came, this machine came with two two terabit hard drives. And obviously they're used hard drives, they're from 2017, I don't think these are original to this machine, but yep, it came with two two terabit hard drives. And then if you look under here, uh, there, there was a screw on either side that I've already taken out, this cover slides off, and there's a couple more parts. So we see there's a couple of hard drives here, there's a one terabyte Western Digital blue laptop drive. Now this is definitely not original to this machine because as you can see it's got a sticker on it that says replace with HP spare which is the sort of sticker you get on like HP laptop drives so I presume they've just chucked this in. And then next up it comes with an SSD. Again I don't think this is original but it's a little Kingston 256 gig SSD. It's just a basic SATA SSD. I don't know what model that is. Um, KC600? Yeah it's KC600 Kingston SSD. I don't really need it, but again, useful little thing to have sitting around, so yeah, may as well have that. So that's the other parts it sort of came with. And then finally up here we have the power supply, which is from Akbell, and it is, what wattage is that? I think 350 watt, I think I saw last time I looked at it. I've totally forgot, 400 watt. So 400 watt Akbell power supply, and it's 80 plus gold, which is quite good. But if we go in closer and take a look at the sticker on the side of this power supply, it was quite surprising to me. So here we have the power supply, and here we have the sticker that was very surprising when I first saw it. Now obviously Americans are very proud of building things, so it's proudly assembled and tested in the USA by George H. Um, yeah, see if, if that said made in the UK I'd expect it to catch fire. But yeah, that's the sort of who made it and when it was made. But the key thing is when it was made. Now if we notice being an American date, because, well it is, that's the 10th of January 2022. Now at the time of filming, 
It's the 13th of October 2022. So this machine is way less than a year old. Which makes it an even better deal. Because speaking of pricing, I hadn't really mentioned that. A Xeon D motherboard based around this sort of platform and this particular chip currently probably costs around £800. Xeon D platforms are really expensive. So you'd be looking around about £800 just for this motherboard really. Then you factor in that this also came with 64 gigs of RAM, the network mezzanine card, that alone is worth, we'd probably be buying that new, probably about a grand if not more, and I paid 450 for this. And then you factor in the fact this came with a couple of extra hard drives, 450 for this is a stupidly good deal. And then you factor in that it's less than a year old, it's ridiculously cheap. So I was looking at that thinking, wait, so someone's bought, this machine has, was made in January, and somehow, in the space of 10 months, it's come from the USA to the UK, it's been put into service, it's then been taken out of service again, and then it's gone to a recycling company who's then had time to go through it and process it amongst all the other machines they'll be processing, who's then had time to list it on eBay, then I've had to buy it, and then it's had to come here. All that in about 10 months. How long was this machine actually used for? So that kind of got me thinking. This Optane drive, I'm pretty sure is original to this machine. Because a lot of the Datto machines that I've seen on eBay, I think in fact, all of them come with an Optane drive like this, and it'd be a bit, bit of a weird thing for the recycler to put in. So I suspect this is original to the machine. So the other day what I did is I fired it up and took a look at the smart data for this SSD. And I was very pleasantly surprised. Because according to the smart data, this drive has only had 46 power on hours. I have a suspicion this machine was possibly never actually used in service because it's almost spotless inside and the SSD has been powered on for such little time that I can't see how it reasonably could have been deployed for this SSD to only run for 46 hours. So yeah, that was very surprising. I'm pretty sure that for £450 I essentially got a brand new system that's worth well over a grand. So yeah, that was a very good deal. So yeah, I was very pleasantly surprised with that. So what we now need to do is continue stripping this down, really just get the motherboard out, get all these parts tidied up, and I'll take a look at the parts here, and then all the other parts going into the new build. So now here we have the motherboard, so we'll take a quick look at this before we take a look at the other parts. So I've already covered some of this before, but we can see all the, the I.O. on it. So we've got, on the back, in terms of I.O., you've got a serial port, a VGA port, this is like a locator button, so you press that and it lights up, or you can light it up from the IPMI. And speaking of the IPMI, you've got a gigabit interface with the IPMI here, and a pair of USB 3 ports. And your mezzanine card would go in here and provide the network ports, which would sit on the back plate. Of course, you've got standard power connectors, you've got a 24 pin ATX and an 8 pin EPS. Loads of 4 pin fan headers, there's three up here, one here, um, one here, and one here. So all the fans I'm putting in can be connected over 4 pin for PWM control. You've also got your 8 DDR4 slots, which will be running quad channel. CPU's under that heatsink there. And then we've got expansion slots. So as I mentioned before, we've got the mezzanine card, where you can either put a card like the one I've got here in, which just connects up Ethernet 5 to the onboard, or the next built into the CPU. But two of those other slots there can also carry PCI Express if you want to use a card that uses PCI Express. Then down here you've got some PCIe slots, you've got a 16 x slot, and an ATEX slot, which is open back, so you can put longer cards in if you needed to. But it's set up that if you put an ATX card in here, this drops down to ATX as well. So it's either one 16x card or two ATX cards. There's also an M.2 slot, so that had that Optane drive in it. That's got four PCIe Gen 3 lanes. All the PCIe on here is Gen 3, which is good. So you can use that for SSDs or anything like that. Over here we can see we have the A-Speed chip, which is an AST2500. That's the out-of-band management controller because this board has full IPMI capabilities. Then finally down the bottom board we've got all the ports. So we've got a bunch of different things here. Serial port there, USB 3 header there. That's right angled, so I'll need to potentially get a right angle adapter again to try and get it in because it'll probably not fit in the case like it is, but that's fine. Connected for all the front panel I.O. And then finally here we've got all the SATA ports. So as I mentioned, this is all SATA, it's not SAS, but that's absolutely fine. You've got four ports here. The red one is, is red, I think that's for SATA DOMs, so you can, I think it's powered, so you can put a SATA DOM in and that's powered. And then you've got these two mini SAS connectors here that also carry four ports each. So essentially you've got eight, or sorry, 12 SATA ports here down, down here, which is quite good. So yeah, that's the parts that's taken out that Datto server. So what we'll now do 
is we'll get all the other parts in and take a look at all the parts we're using for this build. And then we'll build it. So as is a NAS, we need some storage. And that's what we've got here with these SSDs. So here I have a bunch of crucial MX500 SSDs. I've used the MX500 extensively along with the older MX200, MX100, and I can't think of I've ever had an issue with them. They've always been rock solid SSDs. You can get them for a very reasonable price nowadays, they're often on sale, but they're not cost cut really. They've got full DRAM cache and all that sort of stuff, so they're proper good drives. I've got six one terabyte drives and two 500 gig drives. Now this is where we'll talk about how I'm actually gonna set this up in software. I'm gonna try something a bit weird that's a bit niche, but I feel could work very well. With my previous server, I just use FreeNAS or TrueNAS nowadays, but the downside of that is it's not super easy to expand cheaply. You have to add in bulk groups of drives at a time. And while RAID Z expansion is coming to ZFS, it's probably still a while off. But for now, I want something that's very easily expandable. Now, if you look online, the immediate thing people jump to with that is Unraid. And I'm going to get shot down, I'm not going to go into too much detail, I've just... I Something with Unraid, and I can't work out what it is, just unsettles me a little bit. I don't know what it is. It seems to just not really know what it is. It, it seems to say it's a hypervisor gaming server for people's desktops and extreme gaming, also data storage and everything else, and also for your business. It just seems to be a... It seems to just try, try and be too much. And then just looking at some of the forums, I've just seen a few red flags. There's things like, apparently, this might have changed, but apparently there's no way to get security patches between feature releases. I might be wrong, but just seeing that sort of stuff just is a little bit of a red flag to me. And then additionally, it talks about, there's, I've seen stuff on forums saying like, oh, it's good because it now enforces a, web, a password for the web interface. It's like, well, surely that should be a feature out of the box. But what, but what I do like about Unraid is the way it's sort of drive storage array works. Now, if people don't know how that works on Unraid, essentially the, what it does is it pulls a bunch of drives together. So when you save a file to it on like a normal RAID array, it will stripe it across multiple disks. But with Unraid, all it does is write it to a single disk. So each file is on a single disk. And what then happens is parity data is calculated to one or two parity disks. So that means if a disk fails, you can rebuild it from the parity information, a bit like RAID 5. But what's quite cool with it is because it's sort of a single file on a single disk without having to stripe it, it means you can very easily expand the array. You can just add in individual disks one at a time and expand the array. And as long as your parity disks are bigger or the same size or bigger than the biggest disk in the array, that's, that's fine. The other cool thing with Unraid is that your actual data disks, the ones in the array, just use standard file systems. So you can use XFS or BTRFS or anything like that. So you can take a disk out, and out the machine, put it into another machine and access all the files. Sure, you can only access the files that are on that disk, not the ones on the other disks, but they're still there. So whereas, whereas there's like, like a traditional RAID array or a ZFS pool, if something catastrophic happens and totally corrupts it, you could be totally out of luck and be unable to recover anything because your files are all striped across all the disks. Whereas with Unraid, you can still recover the files from the individual drives that are still working. So even if you have too many drive failures so you can't recover the array, you can still recover the, the data on the working disks because they're not, not striped, it's just on individual disks. Now, of course, the key thing is, biggest lesson in this, RAID is not backup. Never rely on a RAID array or parity or unraid or anything as a backup. Always back it up, and that's what I'll be doing. So as I mentioned, I like how unraid works, but I'm just not super confident about using it. So I took a look to see if there's an open source way of doing it, because I thought surely someone's come across this and solved that problem. And they have. There's two pieces of technology I can use to get a very Unraid-like setup, but without using Unraid, just using standard Linux. And that is MergerFS and SnapRaid. First of all, we have MergerFS. All that does is take a bunch of disks with individual file systems, so each drive would be formatted with ext4 or butterfs or anything like that, and it presents them as a single mount point. And when you write to that mount point, all it does is it distributes the files across all the drives based on a policy. And that policy can be something like write new files to the drive with the most free space. And then when you open it up, open up the mount point, it just presents all the files as if it's one big drive, which is basically what Unraid does. And then what SnapRaid does is it calculates parity information. So a bit like Unraid, you give it a bunch of disks, you give it multiple one or more parity disks, I'll be giving it two parity disks, 
And, when it, and what it'll do is when you run it, it'll calculate parity data for your array. And if a disk ever fails or a file gets corrupted, you can rebuild just that disk or just that file from the parity data. Now, the one disadvantage of Snap Raid over Unraid is that Unraid's parity information is calculated in real time. Snap Raid, on the other hand, is a program that you need to run on a schedule. So say you'd run that Snap Raid sync every hour or every day. That's when the parity information is calculated. So if you were to write a, write a file to disk, until the next Snap Raid sync runs, that file isn't parity protected. The other disadvantage is that Snap Raid doesn't sort of, it won't keep the array up if a disk fails. If a disk fails, you won't be able to access any of the files that were stored on that disk until you rebuild it. That's a bit of a pain, but I can deal with that. Realistically, I've got enough backups that if a disk did fail, I could access the files I needed. And most of the data on this is more like a sort of archive. It's not like it's live data that's business critical used all the time. The final disadvantage of Snap Raid is it has what's called a write hole. And that is if you were to delete a file or modify a file, until you run the next Snap Raid sync, there's a risk that some other files might not be recoverable if their parity data is computed using the blocks that you've modified. First of all, this can be mitigated a bit by using a second parity disk because that provides additional parity information to kind of cover for that. But what I'll also be using with this is as I'm using ButterFS, that supports snapshots. So I'll be using a script which is a wrapper around SnapRaid called SnapRaid ButterFS. And essentially all that does is it creates snapshots in ButterFS before doing the parity calculation and calculates the parity from those snapshots. And that basically eliminates the risk of this write hole because by modifying any files or deleting any files, they're still going to be stored in that snapshot that the parity is built from until I next run the sync and the snapshot will be recreated. So yeah, that's my plan there. In terms of distro, I'm still toying with that. I'm not quite sure yet. One thing a lot of people use is Open Media Vault, which is like a sort of Linux distro, a bit like FreeNAS, but the idea is, unlike FreeNAS, which is tied to ZFS, Open Media Vault is just a sort of web interface and management front end for any sort of file systems you want. So you can very easily set that on top of SnapRaid and MergerFS, and there are plugins to do that. I played about with it. The plugins were a little bit buggy, and it didn't really wrap very well with merger with SnapRaid ButterFS, so I need to do a lot of bodging. So I don't know if I'll bother with that. It's probably not worth the effort for me. So I'll probably just set the NAS up on Bear Debian and just set it all up from scratch, which will be quite easy to do. I do want the ability to run VMs on this though, so I'm still toying between two different ways of doing that. Either I install Debian Bare Metal and just run VMs on Debian, which would give me a slightly worse VM experience, or I install Proxmox on this and pass through some of the storage controllers to a VM, and that VM will run the, will run the NAS. So here we have the SSDs, as I mentioned before, which is the Crucial MX 500s. We've got six one terabyte SSDs and two 500 gig SSDs. So the one terabyte SSDs will be the main storage array. Two of those will be parity disks, the rest will be data, giving me four terabytes of usable storage. And I can keep expanding that with individual one terabyte SSDs to basically about eight terabytes of storage in this machine. Of course, it would be possible to upgrade to bigger SSDs in the future, put two terabytes SSDs or whatever and get even more capacity. But yeah, six one terabyte SSDs for now and then a pair of 500 gig SSDs, which will be the boot drive. So these will either run Proxmox or Debian, or well, they'll host the VMs if it's running Proxmox. Anyway, these will be the sort of main OS drives, and they'll just be in some sort of mirror. So either a ZFS mirror or Linux MD RAID or ButterFS mirror. So these will be somehow mirrored. So that's, these will be the boot drives there. And next up, we have the power supply. So you'll notice this is a bit of an interesting power supply in the sense that it looks prehistoric, but this is something you'll need to bear in mind if you're going to do a build in a 2U case. You'll notice that a 2U case is the exact same height as an ATX power supply. And that means that you can't really use a power supply that has a top 120 mil or 140 mil fan in a 2U case, because all you'll do is you'll cut off the airflow and suffocate the power supply. Now you do get 2U power supplies or hot swap redundant power supplies and things like that, but those are generally quite deep. So those won't fit into a short depth case like this which is why this case uses an ATX power supply. So what it means is you need to get an ATX power supply with a rear 80mm fan. So the keyword you want to look for if you're buying a power supply for a system like this is an industrial power supply. So that's what this is here. This is a Seasonic SS350ES. And this is one of their what they've called an industrial power supply. So it's designed for applications like this. This is a few years old, I've had it for a while. So it's not, they don't currently make this one anymore. 
But they've basically superseded it with the ES2, which is basically the same thing, just a slightly updated version of it. So they still do the ES2 series, which is a replacement for this, which is 80 plus bronze. They also do the RS series and the JS series, which are a bit higher end. They're 80 plus gold and they go all the way up to 1000 watt. So you're not going to ever have an issue where you can't get a power supply powerful enough in this form factor. The trick is you just need to look for industrial ones. And Seasonic currently have the best range of those. It's got plenty of connectors, but the cables are a little bit short, unfortunately, just because the power supply has to go on the left of the machine and this motherboard has the ports at the far side over here. So I'll be using a couple of extension cables. So I'll pick these up, just a 24 pin extension and an EPS extension. So I'll need to use these to extend the cables. It'll do. I could have got a, bit of a power supply with longer cables, but that would be additional cost and this is perfectly fine. Now, one other trick you could maybe do if you don't want to get an industrial power supply like this is to look at SFX power supplies. An SFX power supply is essentially a bit like an ATX one, but just a lot smaller in all dimensions. And it's designed for small form factor cases. But what you can get is you can quite easily get brackets that will you can screw onto the front of an SFX power supply and then mount it in an ATX case. And the power supply kind of just floats in the middle of the case. While those power supplies do tend to have top mounted fans, you need to be very careful, but you may be able to get a bracket and power supply combination such that it would float in the middle of the case and still have enough space for the airflow with that fan. Now the benefit of that would mean is you could potentially use a power supply that's got potentially better connectors or nicer cables or something modular. You also might be able to get easier, it might be easier to get a power supply with something like 80 plus platinum certification. So that's another option as well. Now next up, you might be looking at this case and thinking, well, how am I installing the hard drives? Well, what I really wanted was a case with hot swap drive bays. But as I've mentioned, there just isn't really any that are short enough depth for the rack. Because what they'll always do is they'll have hot swap bays across the entire front of the machine, which then protrude into the machine and then the case gets really deep. So instead what I've done is I went for this case, which has a two five and a quarter inch bays, and I've bought these. Now, these are probably one of the most infuriating things to get because they're always so expensive for what is a very simple device. And these are often called mobile racks or back planes or hot swap caddies, there's all different names for them. And essentially all this does is a little device that goes into a five and a quarter inch bay and gives you a bunch of hot swap drive bays. If you're buying these in the UK, IC Dock is the big brand that people tend to go for, but they're just quite expensive. So I didn't really want the IC Dock, well, I wanted the IC Dock one, but it was about 150 pounds. I just couldn't really justify that. These ones on the other hand are more of a generic sort of white label device. These worked out about £100 each, which when you're buying two of them is you know £100 cheaper than buying the Icy Dock one. Icy Dock do do a cheaper one around about £100, but it's all plastic, whereas I wanted metal construction. But yeah, that's that there. So essentially what you've got is six individual hot swap drive bays, which you can get a little caddy and put a drive in. That slot in there. It's got a couple of LEDs as well. This one has a locking mechanism as well, so you can put, it comes with a little key you can use to rotate these silver things. It's not really super secure, but it just stops drives accidentally being removed. That goes in your five and a quarter inch bay. And around the back you can see we have individual SATA ports for each drive. Apparently this is capable of SAS as well. I've not tried it, but it does say that it is um, SAS, SAS 12 gigabit capable. I'm only going to be using SATA, but yeah, you've got your individual ports there. And a single SATA power connector. It also has a 40mm fan on the back, which will cool the drives. This is a bit loud, it's not too loud, it's just slightly grating, annoying noise. So I'm replacing that with those noxios over there. But yeah, that's what we've got there, so that's going to go Two of those are going to go into the case. Now, as I mentioned, the fans are quite loud, so I picked up these no these Noxio fans, which are the a A4X20s, which are really good fans. Um, these are very common for sort of retrofitting into networking equipment because they're quite thick 40mm fans and they're dead quiet, but they move a lot of air. So all I'll do is I'll replace the fan on the drive caddy with this. So I've got two of those fans there as well. And obviously to connect these up to the motherboard, we need some cables. So as I mentioned, the motherboard has these two mini SAS connectors. So what I've done is I've bought this breakout cable, which goes from a mini SAS connector on one end to four SAS connectors on the other end. So we've got two of these, because that's one for each mini SAS connector, and that'll be four drives on each. Finally, what we need is that'll give us four more drives, because we've got six, um, six drives on each caddy, and those four drives will connect up the standard SATA ports on the motherboard. So for that, I could have just used four standard SATA cables, but I thought I'd try something a bit nicer, so I got this, which we'll take a look at. There'll be part links for all these in the description. And this is essentially four SATA cables in one. Now, realistically, all it is is four SATA cables, and then they go through a sort of braid in the middle. But I thought this is quite neat, because 
First of all, it's the sort of thin server style SATA cables, which are they're all foil, you know, foil seat shielding and all that sort of stuff. But they're just a lot easier to bend and move around than a big thick sort of plasticky SATA cable. And then being in one braid just makes it nice and convenient. And then just simple things like they're all numbered, so you can identify each end from each other end. So I picked that up, picked that up thought that was quite neat. And you can actually get these in really large variants. You can get these up to like six drives, maybe even ten drives. So I'll leave the links for that in the description as well. So there's a couple of little smaller parts left. The first one is just this. Very boring. It's a USB 3 header right angle adapter. And that's just because the header on this motherboard sticks out sideways, so it'll, I wouldn't be able to get a connector into that. So all it does, I bought that, dead cheap, and that'll just push into there. And that just means a USB 3 header now sticks straight up, so I can get a connector into that. So that's just a very simple little thing there. Now the final device we have is one that looks a little bit weird. And that's this. This is a SATA controller that connects to PCI Express over an M.2 slot. Now the reason I'm going for this, and I don't know if I'm necessarily going to need it, and I might return it if I don't need it, but is if I decide to run Proxmox on this bare metal, I'll need to pass through at least 10 of the SATA ports to a VM to run my storage stuff on. Now with this motherboard, these two mini SAS connectors are on one PCI Express lane or port or whatever they call it, IOMMU group, that's the word. These ports here are on another IOMMU group. So I can pass through these separately from these, however, I will still need drives to boot the machine. I can't pass through 10 of these ports and keep two out for the Proxbox host. So I bought this additional controller here, so what that means is I can pass through two SATA controllers and keep one back to boot the machine. I'll leave a link for this as well. This is based around a J-Micron JMB585, I think, which is just a 5-port PCI Express SATA controller. Now, I'd say this is a slight warning if you're buying cheap SATA controllers, is a lot of them are very dodgy, and this one isn't, probably isn't great. So I'll be very interested to see how reliable this is. However, you do need to be quite careful. There's two different things you really need to think of when you're buying these. First of all, is are they all genuine SATA ports running off a SATA controller, or are they using port multipliers? You can quite easily get very cheap SATA controllers that have like 20 odd ports, but what they're actually doing is they're taking a device like this that has five SATA ports, and then hooking five port multipliers off of that, each of those fanning out to four ports. That'll give you 20 drives, but each of your four drives is constrained over a single SATA 6 gigabit interface to one of the ports on the main controller. And then you're squishing that down even further onto like an X2 PCI Express lane, or two PCI Express lanes. This doesn't have that issue because this is just literally a five port SATA controller. However, even if you're looking at these, you do need to be quite careful about things like the PCI Express interface. Because it's quite easy to get ones where you're actually going to be constrained by your PCI Express interface. Especially looking at PCI Express generations. Because this is Gen 3, so that's fine. But a lot of these controllers are Gen 1 or Gen 2. In fact, I've even seen ones that have, say, five ports, four or five ports, and they've got a single lane PCI Express Gen 1 interface. And with that, you're literally looking at 250 megabytes a second, which is, you know, not enough for one drive, let alone five. So you do need to be very careful with these. It's just, if you're going to use a cheap controller like this, do your research and make sure you A, get one that doesn't have weird port multipliers in it, and B, make sure it's got enough PCI Express bandwidth for your needs. But additionally, if you're wanting to actually build a NAS with lots of drives, get a proper HBA. The only reason I'm using this is because I literally need two more SATA ports to pass through to a VM. I'm not going to be using a lot of drives off of this. And I'll be interested to see how it goes. I kind of bought this out of sort of morbid curiosity to see how bad it is. And yeah, it's pretty neat though because it goes into an M.2 slot. So it'll go in there and it'll kind of keep it out of the way. So yeah, we'll be using that. Or we won't be using that. It really depends if I'm going to use Proxmox or not. If I'm going to use Proxmox, I'll be using that to pass some disks through to the VM. I'll probably only pass the parity disks through and keep the data disks on the more reliable or more trustworthy SATA controller. If I don't end up using that, I can always return it to Amazon. So yeah, we've got that there. So now we've only got a couple of parts left, and that's some cooling. So we've got these three fans here, which are 50mm PWM fans. So we'll be using these fans just to replace the original ones, just to give me some speed control. Because this motherboard has really good built-in speed control in the BIOS, so I can very easily control all the fans. So we've got three of those to replace the original fans. And then finally, we've got this big heat sink. So I mentioned this earlier, but obviously this motherboard is designed for cooling using sort of high airflow through a case. 
So in a 1U or even a 2U case, you'd have big fans that run at full speed, potentially air deflectors going over this, and that would keep it cool. But I don't want that in this case because that would be really loud and, well, these fans aren't exactly going to do that. So I need to have another option. And realistically, all I need to do is mount a fan to this heatsink. Of course, the easiest option would just be to zip tie a fan on. I could have done that, but I came up with another idea. Now, you can actually get replacement coolers for this particular chipset or this particular CPU. However, Supermicro seems to be the only company that makes it. It's about £60. It takes a couple of weeks to arrive because companies have to order it in. And people still complain the fan's really loud, so I need to factor in the cost of an additional fan as well. So I thought, well, I've already got a heatsink here. I tested it by putting a fan on top and running Prime 95 and it didn't get hot, so it was fine. So all I need to do is figure out a way to mount a fan. So my initial plan was just also just to zip tie a fan on, and to be honest, that would be perfectly fine. But I had a slight, uh, sort of slightly weird plan, and that is that I saw these. So this is a copper heatsink server cooler. You can find these online. I bought this second hand. It's a cheapo Akasa AMD Optron cooler. It's a very old AMD Optron cooler, so it's totally obsolete. But you can find these looking on like AliExpress for like server copper cooler or something like that. Now I'm not going to be using the cooler itself. But by having a solid copper heatsink, what they tend to do is rather than screw the fan into the heatsink, they have this aluminium profile that sits over the heatsink and screws into the side. So what I did is I deliberately looked up a heatsink like this, this is only about £17, I looked up a, a heatsink like this that had a heatsink that was the exact same width as the heatsink on this board. So my plan here is to take this aluminium sort of assembly and fan off of this heatsink and somehow mount it onto this heatsink. So yeah, this is my slight bodge for cooling. Again, we'll see that once it's all built. But yeah, that was a look at all the parts that will be going into this build. It's definitely a bit of an interesting mismatch of parts and some little bodges of that cooler, but it should be quite a fun build. So there you go, that was a look at all the parts, and now we can finally do the fun part and start building this thing. And there you go, with that, the build's now complete. So what we'll do is we'll pop it all open, take a look at what I've done, talk about some of it, because it probably looks very messy, but 
there is very little you can really do about something like this. But we'll talk about what I've done, and then we'll try it out and see if it works, because hopefully it does. I've not actually turned it on yet, so fingers crossed I've done it all right. So yeah, first of all, obviously looking at the front, you've got the hot swap drive caddies, and these now have the SSDs in them, so you can pop that out, pop one out there, and that's now got an SSD in it. I think that's one of the 500 gig ones, because one of the top ones. So yep, yeah, that's the SSDs in there. They fit very neatly into those caddies, which looks great. So here we have the inside. And obviously you can see there's an absolute ton of cables, but I've tried to manage them as best I can. In rack mount cases, you don't really have the space that you'd get in a nice desktop case where you can root stuff behind the motherboard tray. With this, you've really only got you know, you've only got one side panel, so you can only really root the cables where you really can. So obviously I've got the power supply here, and as I mentioned earlier, the cables on it aren't really long enough to reach all the way from here, all the way around to here. So I've used these extensions, so I've got an 8 pin EPS connect extension and a 24 pin extension and those both extend down here and go into the motherboard. And what I did is I took those um, hard drive bays out because I'm not going to use them and then instead of having them there I was able to put zip ties through the holes in this metal plate and secure all the cables down. So even though there's a lot of cables floating around, they're all very solidly in place, like none of these are really going to move, they're all very sort of tied up nice, nice and tightly so they're not going to move and get in the way of fans or block airflow. Next up we've got all these cables for all the drives. And I am so glad I went for these super thin SATA cables because this would have been an absolute nightmare with full size sort of ribbony type cables. Now if you look down to the rat's nest behind the drive cages, you'll see a couple other things I've done. First of all, you'll see that I've replaced those sort of included fans with these notches as I mentioned I was going to do. And that'll now be a lot quieter. And these are obviously PWM fans, so one of them just connects the motherboard header under here, so that's very a very simple route. For the other one, there wasn't any motherboard headers around here. The only spare header was up here. So I've used, a I've used an extension cable that comes under, up, round here, and it's connecting over here. So it's a bit of a weird cable route, but that means it's connected to its own PWM header. The other option I did have was just to use a PWM splitter, which actually the fans came with. So I could plug it into that single header there and split it out to both fans. And that would work absolutely fine. However, I would lose speed monitoring for one of the fans. I'd only get the speed from one of them. And that means if one of these fans ever failed, the motherboard wouldn't be able to... Well, if the fan that didn't have the speed monitoring failed, the motherboard wouldn't detect it and wouldn't indicate it on the fault light. So I thought, given I've already got the extensions, and let's face it, I don't really need... I don't really have an issue running a long cable, given there's cables everywhere anyway. I thought, I'll connect the other fan to this header over here. So now both fans are independently monitored, so if any fan in this system fails, the system will know and it will alert me. The other thing I've done here is I've relabeled some of these cables. So as standard, all these cables just came with, with the connectors labelled P1 to P4. I don't know what the P stands for, but it had P on it, so I kept up. I just kept up with that. For the SATA to SATA cable, I've just used it as is, so I've used that for the first four drives. But then for the mini SAS breakout cables, what I've done is I've relabeled them. So like you can see there, that's labelled P7, that's labelled P6, go all, all the way down it goes P11, P10, P12. So I've relabeled all of them on this side, and then the other side, obviously the SATA ones are just using the original labels, and then I've relabeled the mini SAS cables. So that one's P5 to P8, and that's P9 to P12. So it just means that I can easily see which drive bays are mapped to which connectors at this end. And then finally we have the CPU cooler. So I have bodged this a little bit, but I'm happy enough with it. My original plan was to take that aluminium profile, take off the original heatsink, drill holes in it, and screw this aluminium profile onto that heatsink. And that would have worked quite well. However, I, well first of all I looked and I don't have a small enough drill bit, I think I broke it. And I just didn't really want to go to all that effort because I found that I can actually just slip it into this heatsink and it fits perfectly fine. So if I pull that up, you can see what I mean. So if I slide this sort of profile like this into the outer two fins of that heatsink, the tension of that is way more than enough to keep it in place. And that worked fine with just the metal, but just give it a little bit of extra, get extra friction, I put a bit of duct tape on either side, a bit of a bodge, but that works perfectly fine, that makes it much more grippy. And when I slide that into that heatsink, that is absolutely not going anywhere. And that's also connected with a 4-pin cable into the motherboard for full PWM control. And then finally, looking around the rear of the machine, we have basically what we had on the old one. We've got the same I.O. So we've got a VGA port, serial port, a two 10 gig NICs, two USB 3 ports, and then the IPMI management port. A bunch of expansion slots we could use in the future, and then the power supply. So, yep, that there is a finished build. And while it isn't the prettiest thing in the world, I'm dead happy with how it turned out. Okay, so it's now the moment of truth. Let's fire this up and see if it works. And I've genuinely not even like, powered this on yet, so this could all blow up. I mean, it shouldn't, but let's see. So I've got to connect to this little CCTV tester. I did a video about this before. 
essentially it's a little, it's sold as a CCTV tester, but it can test network cables and stuff like that. And it also works really well as a little battery operated VGA monitor. So we'll be using that to test it. So let's turn the power on the back and see what happens. Okay, no fire yet. And I can see the IPMI heartbeat light on the motherboards come on, so that's a good sign. So now, if we turn it on, hopefully it works. There we go, so first test is I've wired the power button right correctly, that's good, and the power light as well, that's good. And it's, yep, it's turning on, good. So I've not broken it, that's that's nice. I mean, obviously I tested the old server, so I, I knew the motherboard and everything worked, so it's good to know I'm not broken it putting it in here. But yep, we just need to wait for this to post. It's a server, it'll take absolutely ages to post, so once this comes on, we'll come back. Okay, so the machine's finally posted and we're now back in the BIOS. So I won't go into too much detail here, but if you flick through the BIOS, you can see it's detected the CPU. It's detected all the RAM, 64 gigs. Find wherever the disks would be shown, probably advanced storage. There we go. And in here we can see, yep, it's detected all the drives. So we can see it's detected... And it seems to be missing some of them, interestingly. So I'll need to look at that. Yeah, so it's missing a couple of the drives, so we can see it's detected... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's detected seven of the drives, one of them doesn't seem to be detected, so I'll just go and check the cables on that, and then we'll come back. Cool, that's that sorted. It was literally just a loose SATA cable, so now if you go into storage configuration, you'll see that all the drives are recognised. So we've got the four one terabit drives on one controller, and the other controller has two one terabit drives and the two 500 gig boot drives. So yeah, they're all detected. The other thing I did in here was I tweaked the fan curve settings, so that's under HW monitor. And basically what I've done is I've tweaked them so that the CPU fan still works off the CPU temperature. The front fans are just set at a permanent, I think, 75% speed, and the fans on the drive cages are set to, I think, about 60% or 55% speed. You can also make all that work off the CPU temperature as well. You can know, see all the fan speeds there, you can see the temperatures, and yep, there's all the fan speed settings. So it's actually pretty flexible here, you can sort of set individual levels for the fans, and then if you go into smart fan control, you can set this, what level each speed is, or what speed each level is, and also what temperature bumps up to the next level, so it's fairly flexible. You can also set it in here, and as default it is set, to pass fan control over to the BMC, and that does allow the fans to automatically ramp up and down based on CPU temperature but I can't find anything in the BMC web interface to actually configure the fan curve, so I don't know if that's just not a feature on this, so I've decided to set it to manual control where the BIOS thing controls instead of the BMC, and I've got that more customised fan control. So yeah, machine seems to be working. So what I'll now do is I'll go away off camera, get it all set up, play a bit with loads of different software, and I'll come back with at least some sort of working solution. And we're back, and I've now got all the software set up, and I've got the machine working. I tried out a few different options, and I've settled on running Debian bare metal using Snapread and MergerFS for the file system, and then just running VMs on top of Debian just using KVM. I've also installed Cockpit, which is a sort of system management web interface, and that's got a nice web UI for creating VMs and stuff, so I can use that to make it a bit easier than using the command line for VMs. I also tried out using Proxmox, and that did work, so I was able to set up Proxmox, pass the little cheap PCIe controller, or SATA controller, through to the VM, as well as one of the onboard controllers, and that worked fine. All the drives showed up and it worked great. I just, decided, I just decided to go for Debian just to keep it a bit simpler because with this machine, it's a NAS that occasionally needs to host VMs. It's not a VM host that stores files. So I thought, focus on the NAS aspect of it. It can run VMs if it needs to. Because long term, if I wanted to host a lot of VMs, I'd rather have a separate VM host or move some of the stuff that's on this off onto something like a Raspberry Pi because the stuff it hosts isn't actually that, that power hungry or anything. So yeah, that's the software setup there. Now with Proxmox, I mean, I use this little cheap SATA adapter, and while it did work, I did end up having issues with it. And what I found is that, say while running a SnapRaid scrub, it would run at a gigabyte a second for like a minute or so, and then the speed would start dropping down, it dropped down to about 500 megabytes a second. So I took a look into this, and what seems to happen is that out of the box this runs at full PCIe Gen 3, which is what it should do, but after stressing it, it would drop down to PCIe Gen 1, I can't quite work out what's causing that, and I don't know if maybe there's a weird incompatibility or something, or just this, this card's rubbish, which is probably the more likely option, I'm not sure. But that was an issue I had. 
I could, you know, try and debug it more, put it in different machines, test it out, but realistically, I'm not going to use it anyway because I'm running Debian Bare Metal, so I'll just return this to Amazon. But that's something to bear in mind. When I got this, I remember saying this, it was, I was a bit suspicious of it, and normally I don't trust cheap SATA controllers, and ultimately that's the sort of issue you get with these. But yep, as I mentioned for the software side of things, I've got my SnapRaid and MergerFS. So on this machine, I've got all six storage drives, the one terabyte drives, are formatted as ButterFS. And I've mounted them at various different mount points to indicate whether it's a parity disk or a data disk. The top two disks are, well the top two disks in this machine are boot drives. These are just in the Linux MD mirror, so they're just ext4. The next drives down are the two parity drives, and then the next four drives are data drives. Then MergerFS mounts these four data drives together into one big pool. So if we take a look at that, you can see we have one big pool with all the files in it. And then if you look inside the individual data drives, you'll see they have the same directory structure. However, only some of the drives or files are stored on each drive. So for example, here if we look at a directory listing for a folder of all my YouTube videos, you can see in the pool we see all the videos. But if you look at the directory listing of that folder on each individual storage drive, you'll see each drive has a subset of those files. So that's kind of how it works. Each file is stored on one drive and then it all MergerFS presents it as one unified file system. Then SnapRaid set up, so SnapRaid runs across all the data drives, calculates parity information and writes it to the two parity disks. You can also run scrubs which go through all the files on the disk or on the whole system, compare it to the checksums the, on the parity drives and if any files don't match it can repair them from, par from the parity data. So that's used to protect against like bit rot and silent corruption. I set those SnapRaid tasks up on a schedule so currently, every 10 minutes, it runs a SnapRaid sync to update the parity data, and then once a week, it runs a full scrub of the system. But you can configure that, and you can even set it up to run, say, a scrub every day, but only scrub 10% of the system every day, so over the course of 10 days, it scrubs the whole machine. It's really configurable, and I really need to play about with that a bit more. I just set this up as a very basic test. And in terms of performance, the SnapRaid is actually really good. For it to build the parity data, so for it to do a sync, it does that at uh, about a gigabyte a second. When doing a scrub, which is where it's just checking the file integrity, it runs that at about 1.7 gigabytes a second, which is loads. I mean, that's really, really quick to do a scrub, so that's really good. In terms of rebuilding if there's a failed disk, that's not quite as fast, but that runs at about 100, 100 megabytes a second or so, which is fine. Realistically, I could rebuild one of these one terabyte drives in probably under three hours, so that's not too bad. So yeah, that's the sort of performance you get with SnapRaid in terms of all the parity calculations and rebuilding. In terms of the performance for accessing the machine, because I only have gigabit ethernet devices currently, I can't really test this to its full potential. So it maxes out at about 100 megabytes a second using Samba. I'm just using Samba to share the files out. But because of the way this works in terms of the architecture, realistically, you're gonna get the full speed of a single SSD. So probably about 500 odd megabytes a second you're gonna be looking at read and write. In terms of noise and power consumption, I'm pretty happy. Noise wise, yeah, there's a bit of fan noise, but once that's in the cabinet, it'll be absolutely fine. And realistically, I can adjust the fan speeds. And compared to my old server, the lack of hard drive noise is great. And it was almost a bit of a weird thing to get used to, because at one point I was just doing some tests just to test out the file system. And I was looking at, obviously, the disk activity LEDs blinking, and then not hearing any hard drive, any disk activity noise. And then that felt weird, because I'm like, why can't I hear the drives? Oh yeah, they're SSDs. Whereas in my old machine, you as soon as you just even slightly write to it or access it, you hear all those hard drives rumbling away, it's really loud. So yeah, the lack of hard drive noise is great. And that was my main reason for going full SSD. And then in terms of power consumption, I'm also really happy. When I first tested it out, I was a bit worried because it was pulling about 60 watts at idle without even any have, having any disks in it. This is when I tested it at the old server, and I was a bit worried about that. But I dug around in the BIOS and realized that the C states were all disabled, or I think it was maybe only going to drop down to C1. So I reconfigured those so it can drop down to C6. And with that all set up, with this machine connected to the network, fully powered on, all the drives in, IPMI connected, all that sort of stuff, it draws about 48 watts, which is absolutely great. I can't quite remember how much my old server is, but I think it's 60 to 80 watts. It's a fair bit more. So this is already quite a big power saving. Now, I could have probably got a bit lower power consumption if I hadn't gone to the Xeon D-based platform because Xeon Ds are obviously based off their server chips, so they don't have all the C states that their desktop chips support. So this only goes down to C6, whereas their desktop sort of 
i3, i5, i7 type chips, they've got many more C states. So they can drop down to much lower power states when they're not being used. I think also if I built this using a Xeon E chip, they might have also had more had more C states because they're based off the desktop chips. So that could have been an option if I really wanted the lowest power consumption possible. However, the Xeon D has a lot of benefits in terms of performance, ECC memory, all the onboard storage and 10 gig and all that sort of stuff. And I'm dead happy with 48 watts. That's perfect. In fact, I remember a few years ago, well, many years ago now, when I built one of my first home servers, that was a Intel Atom D525, like a super cheap little dual core Atom and a pair of SATA hard drives. And I'm sure that pulled about 50 watts. So going from that to this and having the same power consumption is quite impressive to me. So yeah, that's power consumption. Absolutely fine. So I guess the final thing we need to do is mount the rails onto the case and get it installed in the rack. Okay, so to put the rails on, all we need to do is take the inner rail out. I think they're the same on both sides. We slide the front of it under that little tab there and put a single screw into the back there. So get that screw in place. And then we'll do the same on the other side. And then all we need to do is clip the rails into the rack and then get the server slid in. And there we go, that's the rails now in place. And these rails are really good because of that clip-in style, so it makes it super easy to install it in the rack. Especially for a rack like this where you can't really get into the rear of it without having to pull it forward and unscrew the back, it makes it, it's, it's so easy to just be able to clip it in at the front and back without having to take the rack apart, so that's really good. So yeah, got one rail in there, one rail in there. So all we need to do now is take the server and slide it in. And then we can put a single screw to the front to secure it in place. And there we go, that's now installed in the rack. And yeah, those rails make it much easier. So yeah, that's it in there. Connect up to the switch and the PDU down the bottom. Um, and yeah, and you see there's a single screw on each side. That screw secures it into the rail. So that's not actually holding the weight of the server or anything. That just stops it being able to be pulled out. So if you want to pull it out, you undo those screws. You don't really need those. You could actually leave those out and then just be able to pull the server out, you know, totally as you please, but you can screw it in like that. So yeah, that's the server installed in there. So there you go. That's my brand new fully SSD based home server. I'm dead happy with how it turned out. Build went pretty well. Really like the end result. And yeah, it'll be really interesting to try it snap rate emerger FS long term. So obviously that's all installed there and working away. So what I now need to do is sort of get it all set up, get the VMs moved on to it, get all my data moved off of that server onto this one and then rebuild that one as a backup server. So that'll take a little while. But yeah, I'll go away and do that and really interested to try this out long term. So yeah, there we go. Thank you very much for watching. And if you're interested in buying any of the parts used in this build, especially this case from Server Case, there's links in the video description and in a pinned comment. So yeah, thank you very much for watching.